Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast. I'm your host, Rafe Kelly. At Evolve Move Play, our aim is to help you cultivate a more meaningful life and a more heroic self by reconnecting deeply to movement, mindfulness, nature, and community practices. This podcast was created to bring the best and brightest minds in all of these subjects together to better understand how we can create an empowering and sustainable ecology of practices for personal growth. If you're interested in being part of this ongoing conversation, the best way you can support us and get involved is by joining our Podcast Plus membership. By joining, you will get backstage access to our live podcast airing once a month, as well as a private question and answer session with me and our guests after the show. On top of that, you'll get access to our thriving online community where you can continue these deeper discussions with people all over the world who are just as passionate and curious about these topics as you. More details about the membership as well as the link to get signed up are in the description below. And whether you can join, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so that you can be notified every Monday when our episodes drop. Thanks so much for your support, and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. This week, my guest is John Rebakey. Uh, Followers of the podcast will, of course, be familiar with John, who is the Director of Cognitive Science at the University of Toronto. And he's also the author of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series on YouTube, which has been a huge influence on me, as well as many other people. Um, and the book, uh, Zombies in Western Culture, multiple scientific articles on relevance realization. Um, and he has upcoming books as well. John has been an incredible mentor for me in understanding meaning and philosophy and psychology and cognitive science. And there's one area where he and I have had a kind of difference of opinion, it looks like, which is I tend to agree with Jordan Peterson that uh, postmodernism has been a really negative um, factor in the development of the culture wars. And Berbeke has a much more nuanced and positive outlook on elements of postmodernism that I didn't really understand. So I wanted to have a discussion with him about that. I felt like it's a little bit off the scope of the normal topics we talked about here, but it's something that keeps coming up in our conversations and I wanted to really dig deep into it. So prior to this conversation, I made sure to do a little bit of research and I did um, I did start to change my, my own opinion a little bit and understand more deeply what was happening within postmodernism and how it related to modernism. So once we start talking, I think it becomes a very interesting discussion and we dig deep into you know, what's going on in the rise of the culture war, both on the left and the right, and how it interacts with both sort of the problems that modernism or modernity has inherently and the rise of postmodernism, what we can learn positively from postmodernism, um, as well as why it fails in some senses and how this interacts with for cognitive science and ecological psychology and many of those themes that we talk about on this channel and um, embodiment. So this is a really deep conversation. It's also fun because it's it, it, it overlaps in many interesting ways and I think actually develops uh, some of the themes that um, came out in John Drake's recent conversation with Jordan Peterson. So if you're following that one, I think you'll also get a lot out of this one. So, you know, as all of my conversations with John are, this is a pretty dense conversation with lots of terminology. So a few things you guys should probably know, and if you if you know all the terminology, you can go ahead and skip ahead and uh, start watching the video. But um, there's a few things that I wanted to just ground here. So we talk a lot about epistemology. Hopefully everyone who's been following us understands what epistemology is. But epistemology is just, you know, your theory of how we know the truth of something. And Ontology, the next word we're gonna look at is your theory of being. What, what is the nature of being? Um, and those are important to understand. So we'll be talking about epistemology and ontology uh, from the perspective of how the ancients saw it, how it arose in modernism and, um, and how it shows up in, in, um, in postmodernism. And then the last one that I wanted to to make sure you guys knew was autopoiesis. And you'll hear Verveki talk about this a lot if you've been following him, but an autopoetic um, thing is a thing that is self-making. So fire will consume fuel in order to produce more fire, but it doesn't have the capacity to seek out fuel intentionally. And autopoetic things are things that have the capacity to seek out the means of their own creation intentionally. 
So that, that's what we mean when we say autopoiesis. And so we'll be talking about affordances and autopoiesis and how they relate to, to you know, epistemology and ontology. So you know, bear with us, it's a really deep conversation. I think it's very, very useful. Um, I think it's one of the best dialogues that John and I have had. So without further ado, enjoy my conversation with John Reiki. John, this is my official welcome to the, uh, uh, the Evolve Move Play podcast for who knows how many of the time. Um, <laughs> so Thank today you. we're going to dialogue about something that um, that I think is one of a, a sort of a contention point between our two worldviews and um, something that we've touched on a few times, but I haven't wanted to dig deep into because I thought it sure. really did uh, a deep treatment. So um, I... Uh, the, the question that we're really looking at today is postmodernism, and then, um, you know, we'll see what else comes out of it. But okay, uh, okay. But I, want, I figured I'd start with a question, which sure. is, what is the role of postmodernism in the meaning crisis from your perspective? Um. So, I, I mean, the pro. I mean, it, it, I, I, I've been struggling to try and treat this respectfully. I'm very critical of treating postmodernism as a, as a unified thing um uh like and i haven't read all of the postmodernists i've read three i've read rorty um and, and, and taken some courses on rorty read derrida deeply sort of reflected on derrida a little bit of foucault and just getting into foucault now um and even between those three there's very significant difference and i and, and I, I i sort of um i, I don't really like rorty I, I i find derrida very thought-provoking and ambivalent towards and I, I kind of really like Foucault in certain areas, uh, especially the late Foucault, uh, when he was talking, when he was doing the technologies of the self, and he gets into a discussion with Pierre Hadot, which many people are completely unaware of. Um, and so, uh, I, I want to hesitate around that. And when I was looking, I was looking through some of the literature, and I was reading, um, I'm, I'm reading probably the best book I've read in my life on Plato, uh, by David Schindler. Uh, it's called. Uh, Plato's critique of pure reason, uh, of impure reason. Plato's oh, yeah. critique of impure reason. It's just it's a brilliant book. And it represents the summation of all this brilliant scholarship that's gone on in the last 15 years. And he said the one thing that seems to unite all the postmodernists is that their common rejection of Plato and Plato's conception of truth. That seems to be the only thing. Um, and I think um, the role they play. The role they can play. I don't want to know that. I don't want to attribute intention to them. They they might even dislike me doing that. Uh, but the role they can play for me and other people interested is the way in which they challenge a certain interpretation of Plato um, uh, that was given in modernity during the the Enlightenment and uh, possibly liberated us from it. Um, now I think all the current scholarship Schindler is. One example, Gonzalez, Rappe, there's a, the, 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 this huge list uh, of uh, current scholarship has basically picked up on this and produced a, a fundamentally new interpretation of Plato. And that, that new interpretation is really driving and affording and motivating my current project uh, work, the work on after Socrates and the work on dialogos and dialectic. So I appreciate this does not mean without criticism, but I appreciate the way postmodernism helped to afford this transformation um, uh, of the take we can have on uh, uh, Socrates and Socratic platonic dialogue. Um, and I think that new take is highly germane to responding to the meaning crisis. Uh, so that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to villainize uh, the postmodernists um, mm -hmm. because I think this function um it, it is very important second point so that's one second there's one way of reading at least reading derrida and he's the one that i know the best sort of derrida and and heidegger because in many ways heidegger is the er postmodernist uh, he's also the er existentialist he's just yeah but he's what people forget is he's also the er for e cognitive scientist in fact originally the four e cognitive scientists labeled themselves the neo heideggerian Mm -hmm. So there's a big in, there's a big move in there, and what you see, you, I can see a lot of similarities, for example, between Dreyfus and Derrida, 
in the criticism of thought as computation. Um, so Derrida's model of compute, what I would call computation is the sort of linguistics, which is very much the model of language as a formal system. So Sir uses the same uh, metaphor, languages like chess, et cetera. And I, I like many neo-Heideggerians or e-cognitive scientists, um, have come to deeply reject the proposal of cognition of computation, which was the premier model of computation, again, given us to us by modernity and the enlightenment. And so postmodernism is also a criticism of that model of cognition. So I see postmodernism as convergent with a critique within cognitive science, but also inspired by Heidegger and aspects of postmodernism uh, that gets us to what you might call a post-computational model uh, which of uh, cognition, which really opens us up again to what do we mean by meaning? And what's its connection to life and embeddedness and inaction, all the four E's. And then on the other side, like I said, and these two are related, the, the, the affordance of this new interpretation, they didn't give it, but they made it very possible. This new interpretation of Plato, um, which is I think far less anachronistic um, and that has opened up for me um, a, a capacity for making use of Platonic uh, or Socratic Platonic dialogue as a model for our current theologos. So for me, those are two very important legacies that I think should be properly appreciated. Okay, so I'd like to kind of put a pin in um, in the new interpretation of, of Plato and right. what you're getting out of that, because I think we could articulate that more deeply, um, but I want to come back to that. Okay. So, So I did a lot of research in preparation for this, sort of digging into what was Derrida actually saying? What was Foucault actually saying? I didn't look into Baudrillard and Lyotard and Lacan, um, but I looked into those specific thinkers and I looked at, at postmodernism as a sort of more general phenomenon and, sure. and how I interact with it. So there's a, I mean, there's a lot of problems in, in, in articulating this, right? Um, once we get into it, the the the, the details start <laughs> becoming quite devilish. But, yes, yes, yes. But um, you know, Peterson makes the argument that that large sections of the Jordan Peterson makes the argument that large second sections of the academy are taken over by what he calls postmodern neo Marxists, and that this has resulted in a sort of ideological conformity. And my, uh, myopia, which is very dangerous and resulting in, in bad scholarship and bad activism, really. And that looks true to me. And I think that we can, we can question to what degree those, that, that phenomenon is directly attributable to the thoughts of the specific postmodern thinkers and still recognize that the phenomenon exists. Yeah. I also I also did a lot of um, listening of James Lindsay, who controversial figure, but I think that there's some value and insight in his analysis of these thinkers, and you know he he basically ends up you know initially say being skeptical of of Peterson's model, and then he reads Kimberly Crenshaw and he reads Angela Davis, um, who are kind of at the beginning of critical race theory, and says actually you can really directly track these people to to, you know, I think it's Angela Davis is a student of Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse is a student of the Frankfurt School. He comes out of critical theory, right? They cite Foucault and Derrida. They're, they're clearly influenced. They're using the, they're using something that comes out of these schools of thought as their operating system. And it results in, in this activism. And so I, I wanted to kind of go back for a second and give you the naive version of my take on postmodernism before we go into the, the more, because I think, I think it's maybe emblematic of how a lot of people have gone through this or, or started to experience it and why people might be really negative towards postmodernism without having actually read the thinkers. That's fair. Uh, I get, and I'm not, I, I want to be clear. I'm not denying those historical legacies. What mm -hmm. I'm denying is the exhaustiveness of those historical legacies. I'm pointing to two other ones that I think are powerfully important and efficacious. They're not being noted as much, perhaps by Jordan. Uh, and you know, and I presented this idea to him directly. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, I, I'm not trying to defend them in the sense of, well, I think they're ultimately right or anything like that. I'm trying, which there's two projects and I don't want them to get confused. One is, are they right? And then one is, right? And that's a, that's a, that's, that's a, question we might never get to the answer of that but the other question is well what's the best historical interpretation of what's going on there? and so what i'm trying to do right now is address the second point yeah so um i guess the way i see it is there's 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 the thinkers who are associated with postmodernism, yeah and the the potential insight or value in what they actually said and then there is the historical phenomenon of how postmodernism played itself out. Postmodernism played itself out, and and those two things they you have to you have to look at both, right? Like in the Bible, it says, "Judge a tree by its fruits." Sure. And and I would say that that there's some fruits of postmodernism that look pretty pretty damning at this stage, and there may be also fruits that are that are much more redemptive. But but through my own experience, I've been much more. Um, impacted by the negatives. So, okay, I'll let, yeah. you, I'll let you let you present your... It's been interesting to kind of go back and think a lot about my own intellectual history as I've been preparing for this conversation. But So I think you might have heard me talk about this, but, um, you know, dyslexic, ADHD, pulled out of school, yeah. had a mentor, took over my education, and uh, read Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings changed my life. And through the Lord of the Rings, I became interested in mythology. So I started reading the Greek and Norse myths. And then we get into Greek and Roman history and then Celtic history and Celtic um, mythology. Um, and then just anthropology in general. So I go to the local library uh, when I was, I think, starting at 11 or 12 years old. And I remember first they had these like big, glossy, beautiful, like picture books of anthropology with short descriptions of, you know, the, the, um, the Mbuti Pygmy and the Maasai and the Dinka and the Givanti, you know, right? You know, Yanomami. So that was like my first, but somehow it's kind of an interesting thing. They had like all of Carlton Kuhn's work, right? Do you know who Carlton Kuhn is? No. Carlton Kuhn is like the last major figure in, I think pre World War II uh, physical anthropology, like measuring skulls. Yeah, yeah. And he, so he, he becomes the devil after, after World War II because all that skull measuring is associated with the Nazis. Okay, of course, right. And he, you know, he, he says that you know different racial groups have different cranium sizes. He's not, he doesn't really say he doesn't he's not he doesn't make a normative case about anything. He just says a few things that can be interpreted as racist. And he probably was slightly racist given the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then we have this move in 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 anthropology of post-structuralism and post-positivism and 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 pots not people, right? People don't move around. And so all everything of that physical anthropology is is sort of rejected and viewed as debunked. But what's really interesting to me is that if you go back and read Kuhn's description of the process of uh, Indo-Europeanization Indo -Europeanization of Europe, um, it's actually surprisingly congruent with the newest genetic data that's come out. Right, right, right. It's, it's very interesting because there's this, um, you know, there's this Nordicist tradition of the Aryan race starting in Northern Europe. And, and that's where the Indo-Europeans come from and they're all blonde. And, uh, and, and interestingly, Kuhn basically says that that um, the early Indo-Europeans were Mediterranean in physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And then they, you see them kind of spread into the East and then they hybridize with, with, um, with what do you, I think he calls them like cro types, which turns out to be inaccurate. But, yeah. but essentially he maps how this happens and it looks very much like what happens with essentially the hybridization of, of Iranian farmers moving up into the Baltic steppes uh, um, Baltic Caspian steppe mixing with um, Caucasian hunter gatherers, and then eventually mixing with um, with the early European farmers and Baltic hunter gatherers. Right. So, anyways, my point is that these were big books, and I was reading them <laughs> when I was 13, 14 years old, and they had a big influence on me. I was very interested in, in physical anthropology. So then I got access to um, a local. Uh, there was a 
my mentor found another guy, Peter Browning, who is uh, an anthropologist in local government, who had a library of, of anthropology texts for me. And so I started picking up and reading um, ethnographies of like the Mbuti Pygmy and the Igbo and um, the Yanomami and all that, like at that age, and when I was 14, 15 years old. Right. So then I and, and started anthropology, all right? And then I got into um, uh, Marvin Harris's work in community college. Sure. Uh, so then I showed up at a university and, and essentially all of that stuff was viewed as like evil, right? right? Everything was cultural relativism, right? If you, if you didn't think, if you were willing to say that a clitoridectomy was wrong, like that was viewed as sort of, you know, not that, you know, not that enlightened. Right. I see. Is this during the same period that crisis in ethnography was going on? So I, um, when, when I was in grad school, I did quite a bit of anthropology, and the, the focal thing there was the crisis in, eth in ethnography uh, as a method. Yeah, I don't remember precisely. I just remember that 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 I I didn't understand the perspective that I was coming into when I came into university, right, and that right. like everything that I learned about anthropology from studying on my own was sort of not not um, you know current anymore right well i'm just comparing when i when i when i encountered this stuff in i did i did when i was doing my cog i did undergraduate work in anthropology and i started encountering this stuff and then yeah. and then when i was in grad school i was doing grad school anthropology as one of my broad, breadth characteristic uh, requirements um and that's that's when i was encountering derrida and that's when i started reading derrida in depth in response to that so we have somewhat similar histories yeah so, so anyways, so I remember I started to have this sense that, that within anthropology, uh, I also read um, Jared Diamond around that time, you know, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Sure. And the, the general response within the anthropology community was very negative towards that and towards Marvin Harris as well and his sort of general synthetic theories of cultural materialism. And certainly like all the physical anthropology and sociobiology, evolution psychology was all viewed as, as completely um, ideologically incorrect yeah. and and I started to have the sense that there was just no interest in understanding in understanding how things actually worked right it was like it was always about particularism and never about trying to 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 see some sort of broad overarching lesson that you could learn I remember taking a class called uh, sex and gender and culture which I was quite interested in and uh and the entire class was on third genders. There was no section in the entire class on how male and female normative behavior differed from culture to culture. Right. right. And, I, and I went up to the teacher and I, and I told her like, 99% of your students are gonna be cisgendered male or cisgendered female. We didn't use that terminology in 2000, but yeah. the basics of it, right? Um, wouldn't it? be valuable to them to have a a cross-cultural lens on what that looks like yeah and, and she didn't have an answer for me she just looked at me like like i was you know an alien <laughs> from outer space <laughs> so so then when i um so then we had one teacher joan stevenson uh and uh she co-taught a class on on uh Evolution of psychology and sociobiology with the, the biology department. So I took that class and was like, oh my God, here are people who are actually trying to understand human yeah. nature, people who have dense empirical basis to de uh, describe yeah. what they're doing, yeah. whose, whose models actually map to the real world that I'm experiencing. I remember before I took that class, it was one of my good friends was taking that class with me and he asked me what it was about. And I was like, what I told him was this guy, E.O. Wilson studied ants and thought he could apply their uh his findings on ants to humans which is totally ridiculous but i'm gonna take the class anyways <laughs> <laughs> right that was the attitude that i had been indoctrinated into at that point yeah. right and then it completely blew my mind when i encountered that and so eventually like i i was sort of just you know completely appalled by what had happened with anthropology i thought it was a discipline that had completely rotted from the inside and this was in 2000 so I left and I, I, I had three, three credits left to finish my degree and I never finished it because I just thought that 
cultural anthropology was just was just completely useless. Right. right. Um, and and at that time, I had started coaching gymnastics and realized that I loved being a coach, and you know that ended up being productive for me. But um, so not long after that, I read Steven Pinker's book, The Blank Slate. Right, where he lays out the idea of the standard social science model, and I was like, okay, that's what we were learning in all these other classes. Right, why that came about, and that that book was extremely compelling and powerful for me. So that's where my kind of uh, perspective on postmodernism came from. And so then over the years, I've seen those same sort of talking points that I feel like you learned in sociology and anthropology 101 propagate themselves through the entire sort of social sphere to the point where you meet people who will say that the reason that men are taller than women is because of social construction, because we don't feed little girls enough protein because of, uh, you know, entrenched systematic sexism and patriarchy. And, and that's the kind of legacy that I've, that I've seen from, from postmodernism. And then as I've seen the rise of the culture war, you know, I've seen this incredibly toxic way of, of, of using relativism to, to drive, you know, to like Peter Bergosian talks about idea laundering, you know, postmodernism is used to sort of use this citation circle where nothing is ever empirically tested to launder an idea and, you know, put it out there. Right. And, and so we have ideas like, you know, that sex is, is a, is a, is a spectrum, right? Um, you know, there's lots of different sexes and the idea of biological sex is socially constructed. That's now a widely held idea, you know, and, and you, know, you can track that to Anne Foster Sterling and see that she basically just completely manipulates the data and, and falsely represents it in order to, to find, you know, in order to, to, to achieve an ideological end. And so this is the legacy of postmodernism from my perspective. And, and I think, you know, like, I feel like since you and I have started having a conversation in the last couple of years, I, mean, I think you can see that the craziness has accelerated really intensely. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, I'm not quite sure what you're pointing to with the craziness, but I think if we're pointing to the same thing, I would agree to it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's on both sides of the aisle, but this this rejection of biology, the reaction, the rejection of denial, the... the um, the policing of ideological conformity, uh, cancel culture, and again, that's on both sides of the aisle. Like that has gotten substantially worse, and I think you're seeing it, um, you know, at every at every level of academia, in the big tech companies. You're seeing it in schools. You know, like we one of the reasons why we wanted to move out of Seattle was in order to basically get our kids out of um, out of the Seattle school district because you know they're equity, diversity, and inclusion um, programming is, is so, is so, um, is so overarching. It's so much the primary focus of it, and it's so unbalanced in the way that it's presented mm -hmm. that it just seems incredibly toxic to children. And we didn't want to have part of that. And I don't know if you've looked at like what's happening with uh, fair or fire and all the all the stuff that they've documented about what's going on like all of this seems to be in some way related to postmodernism and like i i can uh, I'll, I'll give you my theory on on how that's connected but um, but i wanted to kind of uh just lay lay that out and say this is when i when i say you know when i when i attack postmodernism this is the the experience that i've had that that, that leads me to that and that's why like peterson's message was so compelling because he seems to offer a very um, his picture of reality seems to map really well to what I've seen and experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go further, or should? No, I'd love to. I'd love to hear your response. So, um, there's a lot to say there. Um, I guess my 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 response is, um, I think uh, I said this. I said this. I think that. Is it to Jordan? I think uh, Derrida and Foucault are often um, often invoked and very, very rarely read um, uh, because the commitment to rigorous thought and uh, 
criticism, a criticism of the enterprise they're engaged in, of philosophy itself. There are philosophers who are willing to engage in deep criticisms of philosophy. Um, I don't see that in a lot of the phenomena you're pointing to. So the the chief objection I I hear, and I, I'm, um, I, I know you're saying many things, so I'm just focusing on one, but it's, it's a very prominent one, is I want to I want to use a term actually from this this very great book. He yeah, calls yeah. it mythology, which is the hatred of logos. Mm -hmm. And you know, and Derrida has logocentrism, which people have picked up um, as a term, and they and they throw it about. It, which is the it, it, which is the denigration of reason, and and, and you mentioned this, and so um, I don't think we're that far apart. The the denigration of reason, which is not the same thing as, but it also has attendant with it, the denigration of science is found now on both the left and the right. When I when I was growing up, uh, it was very easy for me to do, to call myself the leftist, precisely because the leftists claim to uh, care about uh, argumentation and science. Um, and that's now increasingly not the case. Um, and, and that's why I've become increasingly uh, disillusioned and dissatisfied with um, the left. But that hasn't meant that the right has picked up the gauntlet and now is you know, the staunch defender of reason and science. That's not the case either. Um, and so I think the things that are driving your critique are actually things of which post the postmodern phenomena, as, as opposed to postmodernism, let's say, the postmodern phenomena is actually just symptomatic of it, um, which is uh, uh, romanticism and nominalism, which are actually the more fundamental. So we, we I mean, Schindler does this. He says, you know, you, you basically have Luther. <laughs> And, you, and then you have Rousseau, and then I would add you have done Scotus and Occam, and that's at the foundation, and that's within uh, within modernism. Um, uh, again, that that style of thinking that became predominant in Pinker's Enlightenment model. Pinker is a representative of somebody who is defending uh, modernism without, I think, appropriately understanding his commitment to nominalism and the implicit right, uh, the implicit ways it makes possible romanticism and other things like that. So what is what is I'm saying? Just say John, just I, I'd like you to break down uh nominalism and and, and uh romanticism briefly for the audience. Oh sure. Uh, yeah, sorry. So nominalism was a uh philosophical movement that arose in the late Middle Ages with Duns Scotus, it arose in theology. By the way, all of these ideas tend to get the start there. Um, yeah. um <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, postmodernism is, we can come back to this, is, it's an attempt to really extend Heidegger's critique of ontotheology. So I, I want to put a pin in that and come back to that. Uh, because I think some of the greatest theologians today, like Mark Taylor and John Caputo, are deeply, in, are deeply, are deeply influenced by postmodernism. Uh, so let's go back to it. So what are these theologians doing, Scotus and Occam? They're arguing... Um, I'll try not to be very. The, the basic argument is there aren't real there aren't real patterns. William of Ockham. William of Ockham, where we get Ockham's razor, and it's I find many of the people who advocate for the Enlightenment uh, model of rationality, uh, they, they they frequently invoke Ockham's razor and parsimony, not realizing uh, how much of Plato's beard gets shaved by Ockham's razor. Um, so here's a, here's an ancient model. Here's the ancient model is. Uh, so we ask this question, and we think it's the way to ask the question. And Gerson makes this in his book on ancient epistemology. How, how could how what how do I know? What's is the act that I perform in order to know? And so we 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 turn into the mind, and we do this subjective reflection thing, typified by, of course, Descartes. Now get back to nominalism in a sec. But the ancient world says, no, no, no. Let's take it for granted that there's knowledge, and then. The world has to be intelligible. What kind? What does the world have to be like in order for it to be intelligible? That's the primary epistemological question, but it's simultaneously an ontological question. There's no, there's no deep separation. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, it's about what are the real patterns in the world? What's the real intelligibility out there? The nominalists come up with the idea and say, no, 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 those patterns aren't really there. The patterns are only, we only, we draw all these connections 
between things. And all those connections are just in our mind. They're not out there in the world. And then they're in this weird position, by the way, because then they have to say, there's no real patterns in the world. The only real patterns are in the mind. That already builds in. Descartes' dualism is all ready to go. Because there the world, the world is now fun. There's, right? And the real patterns are only in here. There's no real patterns out there, right? And then what you get is, well, where does intelligibility actually exist? Well, only in the mind. So the thing, the only, the only thing that's intelligible to the mind is itself. And then you get Descartes and you get trapped into subjectivity. You get trapped into the idea that all that I'm doing is getting a coherence of proposition. That's nominalism. Now see what it does? It isolates you inside your own subjectivity. It says that all that matters is a certain internal coherence to your proposition. The connection to the world, the connection to other people has been severed. So I kind of what I'm kind of saying is I think when you're shooting at postmodernism, if that's what if that's the right way of the right metaphor, or, or if that's your target, I think you're missing the target. I think postmodernism, it I mean, you get nominalism, and then that basically makes Cartesianism, and then you get, okay, well, what, do, what is the mind then? It's a completely internal formal system, like a computer. Computer is completely internal. This is a defining feature of a formal system. The formal system, like, like the game of chess, it, you, know, you don't have to refer to the, anything outside of it. It's just internal system of reference and signs. That gives you relativism, that cuts you off, that says, right, there's nothing about the world and like I said, Derrida makes use of Saussure's model of language and cognition as chess, as a formal system. It's all there, it's all there. Romanticism picks up on this. Romanticism picks up on and says, wow, uh, you know, well, what really ultimately matters then is uh, like, I'm, like, I'm not really getting anything from the world. You get, you know, Descartes and then Kant, I'm just trapped inside here. So all that really matters is how I can project onto the world and express onto the world. And so everything is being constructed by me. The person who creates all the doctrines you're talking about is a romantic, von Herder. He is the person who actually creates all these doctrines. Manifesting. Yes. The secret. So I, I just want to just offer something there because, so I, I think a key point that, that I didn't hear you make is nominalism refers to name right so oh, the idea right, right. is that is that, yeah. that the, the the pattern exists because it is named it's an right. inversion of the Tao Te Ching right yeah it's the pattern it of the naming so it's our use think about how this was so central to Derrida it's our use of language that actually creates so the you know these two objects there's no real relation between them it's because it's only because I give them the same yeah. name that in my mind that they come to belong together in some fashion. They don't belong together in the world in any fashion. Now that's obviously true for some things. Some things are totally made to exist, perhaps books because they're artifacts or money because we name them. But nominalism goes stronger than that. And that's why when people invoke Occam's razor, they don't understand what they're doing. It also says there's no real patterns out there in the world, like among pieces of gold, or molecules of sucrose. Yeah, yeah. I want. I just want to really hammer this home because I, 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 I always I keep coming back to like, there's not a better description of reality than the first three stanzas of the Tao Te Ching. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, but you're doing ancient epistemology. Yeah. So, so because because what's happening is the Tao is the Tao that can be named is not the, the eternal Tao. Well, I mean that's the opposite of nominalism. The nameless yeah. is the mother of all things. Yes. Yeah. I, what what exists is always beyond what we can name. And then the name gives rise to the 10,000 things. So what I hear is nominalism inverts this. Yes, nominalism I, inverts it. The, the only way is the way that can be named. The named is the mother of everything. That's essentially what you're saying nominalism says. That's what nominalism is claiming, yes, very much. So, so then romanticism then is a projection of essentially, if that's true, then our role as the as the agent is to project ourselves into the world, such as to create to manifest our reality. Yes, you your task is to imagine so that you can express the world uh, into existence. The world, so it's the opposite. Uh, right, and, and this is again what what Pinker doesn't see. Right, is that the opposite? Uh, the, the, that empiricism's blank slate of the mind and romanticism's blank canvas of the world 
are just mirror opposites of the same underlying conceptual grammar. It's the same way of thinking. If you're bound into the same nominalist epistemology that is going to undermine, and notice nominalism undermines, for, for when you, as soon as you think that, as soon as you are buy into nominalism, you are committed that reason is merely instrumental. Reason is not about coming into contact with reality. Reason is merely instrumental. And ultimately, you'll, you'll get Nietzsche's point that, you know, dialectic is only is ultimately just a form of, it, it has come from rhetoric. It's all just about this. Okay, so for some reason, what I want to bring up, I think I can wrap this in, but so I was listening to James Lindsay talk about, you know, the, the history of, of leftist thought. And there's some really interesting things in this. And there's also some really, for me, there's some really big lacunae like, in his model. Mm -hmm. um, but he basically now tracks it back to Hegel. Right? So mm -hmm. Hegel has this idea of the dialectic, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? Within that, you, you also have your, it's a metaphysics, right? It's about grasping the absolute. It's also then, a misrepresentation of platonic dialectic. Yeah. It is a modernist Cartesian misrepresentation of platonic dialectic. Okay, so then he makes the claim that, so from Hegel, you get the young Hegelians. Marx is a young Hegelian. Marx tries to materialize, to make, in, to, to, to take Hegel and make it a materialist sure. dialectic. Yeah. Dialectical material. Essentially, it remains a, um, it remains a religious sort of system in a way, right? Yes. And there's this idea of a transcendence to the next state, right? We have to destroy the world as it is. It's almost like Gnosis, right? It's very Gnostic. It is. It's, it's very Gnostic. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, and revolution becomes the primary religious act for bringing about the utopia, yes? Yeah. So then, so Hegel, Marx, and then the Frankfurt School, right? So you have Adorno and Horkheimer. And, yeah. uh, and he, he places a lot of importance on Antonio, uh, Antonin Gramsci. Yeah. Gramsci basically lays out five pillars of culture that have to be taken over such that we can destroy the culture as it is in order to allow the utopia. And, and it, there's something very Rousseauian to me about all of this because they're not at all prescriptive of how you actually get to the utopia. They really no. don't have a strong, yeah. you know, they don't have a strong, so okay, so you have Gramsci and he says, okay, Gramsci describes exactly what people are doing. Like, look at what's happening in the academia, look at what's happening in schools, like the schools and also the family. Like Gramsci says, you have to destroy the nuclear family. And of course, now we see all this rhetoric around, you know, you know, destroy the nuclear family coming out of the left right now. So then, then from Gramsci, he traces tra tra to Marcuse, uh, uh, Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse, yeah. he, you have this essay, Repressive Tolerance, which is basically this idea that it, you have to create a one-way dialectic where only leftists, where leftist ideas are always tolerated no matter leftist actions and ideas are always tolerated no matter how violent they are because they move us in the direction of liberation and conservative ideas have to be have to be um uh censored even at the degree of thought right and this is essentially what it lays out so you have marcuse and then marcuse becomes the mentor of angela davis and angela davis and bell hooks create critical race theory or um there's one person I'm, I'm missing in that line, but okay. So then you get, and then yeah. Kimberly Crenshaw, and then you get intersectionality with Kimberly Crenshaw. And that's sort of the, 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 the operating system that all of the activism is, is, is based off. And I find, I think this is, it makes a very compelling narrative. Sure. And I think there's truth in it and I think it's valuable, but here's the problem. I think you can find people saying something you can find people saying kind of whatever you want to say, but is that actually where the ideas came from? Like, I think the line from Marcuse to Angela Davis is very clear, but why is Gramsci really the father of all this? Is everyone going back to Gramsci? And like, even, even the, the role of Derrida and Foucault, as you're saying, like a lot of this may be actually a complete misunderstanding of them. Like I, I read a really interesting essay uh, on new discourses last night about how Derrida is actually really a quite, um, He's not at all the sort of incomprehensible gobbledygook thinker that Americans and experiences him, experience him as. When you 
read them in French. It's just that the way that he's playing with language, the way that he's digging into yeah. language, is very, very dependent on the specific meanings of French words, and it doesn't translate. And That's so yeah, he tries to do something very much like what the Tao Te Ching does. He tries yeah. to sit on that place between poetry and philosophy. And so it gets it gets picked up by like Judith Butler. And I mean, uh, uh, I think the guy's name was Christopher Lord who wrote this, but he basically points the finger at at women's studies as the place in which activism sort of infests academia. Mm. And then you have this, this self-referential, almost cult-like system mm. that gets propagated. And then women's studies gives rise to gender studies, gives rise to uh, re, uh, ethnic studies and, and you know, um, whiteness studies and blackness studies and all, all of these studies things, they all come essentially originally from women's studies. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, um, so anyways, so I, so I don't think that ideas, I think his model is too emanationist. That's what I want to say. <laughs> right? yeah. It's almost nominalist in a way. It's like yeah. these, this bad person produced these ideas and they've colonized the world. And I don't think it works that way. I think there has to be emergent bottom up things that make, that make the world um, ready for the seed of specific ideas. Yeah, you should always, I mean, this is one of the things, I, I know, I'm glad you noticed that self-criticism, right? Well, you're making it there yeah. now, right? Which is, um, well, what you're assuming is the very thing you're, you're, I mean, you're begging the question because you're assuming they're very phenomenal. You're assuming that none of this was motivated by reason or argument or response to circumstance. And then look, it's all just this. And it's like, well, if you assume that there's no argument there, then this looks like, you know, a, a malignant cancer spreading. But if you assume, no, no, maybe there's a lot in the culture that's preparing this, a lot that people don't want to question um uh you know uh, that people are criticizing postmodernism like well me what if there are really deep legitimate criticisms of modernism what if there are and what if this culture also has a mix a weird weird mix of nominalist mon uh, modernism and then it's decadent romanticism running through it and what if those are making these particular ideas particularly attractive right now well, then you need to stand back and criticize. Like, what if, what if the commitment to an individualist model of meaning making is something that postmodernism is actually undermining? And maybe that should be undermined. Maybe there is a problem with individualism. Um, and, and you know, I'm glad you said that because that, that, that resonates with a lot of what I want to say. Is because, like I said, I've seen other areas. I, I gave you two at the beginning where these ideas have been taken up and they, they've liberated, I'm using that language intentionally, they, they've liberated thinking to recover something that had been lost under the blinding glare of modernism, which is, a, I think, a more appropriate reading, a, le a less anachronistic reading of Plato and Platonic dialectic, scaling, allowing us to see how different it is from Hegelian dialectic, by the way, right? Um, and like I said, this new emerging model of cognition as non-computational, as deeply embodied. You and I both advocate for embodiment, embodiment, but it was it was feminist, like Genevieve Lloyd in the book *The Man of Reason*, who started, you know, was a significant contributor to this, and saying, "Like, wait, wait, we are forgetting the we like we did this weird. The mind is masculine, and the body is feminine, and we do all this weird stuff, and then." Right, and then we've left embodiment out, and, and you know, and, and then Heidegger was coming in and saying, you know, well, maybe cognition isn't computation, and all of this stuff is germinating into the idea that you and I are both finding tremendously fruitful right now, which is the deep truth of embodiment. Try and find anybody in the Enlightenment period talking about embodiment. Good luck. Good luck. Try and find anybody doing that in in a way that is going to really. Pardon me. What about Hume? Hume doesn't talk about it. That's exactly the point. Toad's critique of Hume in body and mind is Hume does exactly the opposite. Hume takes an epistemology of an absolutely static spectator. Interesting. And that's, okay. how, that's why he can't see causality in the world. Because if yeah. you sit 
passively spectating, you can't get causality from into from the world, and you will not see causality in ontology. That's the, one of the core of Code's critique of being. Interesting. Code? Yeah. The body and what's it called? The body and the mind, I think. T O D E S. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. So, one of the problems with postmodernism and thinking about it is the problem with what is modernism, right? It's such a big, it's such a big thing to try yeah. to understand, right? And when, like, you know, um, Pinker came out with Enlightenment Now, and, you know, one of my good friends was a huge fan of that book. And I, I just, like, I, I think The Blank Slate is one of the most important books that I've read. You know, I think How the Mind Works and, you know, The Language Instincts is amazing. But Enlightenment Now just doesn't work for me <laughs> for a variety of reasons. And even The Better Angels of Our Nature, I'm very skeptical of in, in parts. But the thing with Enlightenment Now is it seems like he, he extracts a very specific message from it that doesn't represent kind of is not very representational of where it was and then he he also mixes up the ideas from counter enlightenment thinkers with ideas from enlightenment thinkers it's it's not good work but i i would say i mean i like the language instinct but the mind uh, how the mind works i strongly recommend reading jerry Fodor's book the mind doesn't work that way okay because cool. he just well i don't know that book that well so so i'll, I'll just recite my book but that's the cognitive science, right? That's the cognitive science. And so yeah. that's where I can speak to with some expertise. Yeah. And Fodor's critique of that book and, uh, and of its computationalism, which I think is the key yeah. model of, of modernity. Ha Thomas Hobbes, cognition is computation, right? I think Fodor's critique of that. And here's what people need to understand. Fodor is a proponent and a producer of the computational theory of mind. The fact that he is so willing to devastatingly critique it shows you how how like this is not some romantic this is somebody foundational figure saying no no it ultimately isn't working it ultimately isn't working so this is interesting i mean i've arrived it, it, there's, there's funny things happening in this conversation <laughs> because I, I, I before the, you know we were chatting before i was in a conversation with a ecological psychologist right yeah. and we were talking about some of these ideas, right? And about essentially the problem, we're talking about the problem of of the object-subject divide. Yes. And I'm introducing yeah. him to your idea of the transjective because essentially within ecological psychology, they're always talking about the coupling of environment to exactly. Doing, and then these are emergent and they're non they're non-mechanistic, right? Yes. And then all of this is really the, at the heart of the problem with modernity. Now I arrived at this in a very different way through my my work as a teacher, as a movement teacher, right? Yes. Because I, I, I'm trying to remember where I did this talk, but I, I did a talk basically on um, the body is not a machine and the mind is not a computer. Yeah. And, and this was really influenced by your work um, because I, what I was, the argument that I was making is that, um, is that human beings kind of of necessity have to orient their worldview or structure their cognition using analogy. And that in the analogies that are available to us actually can provide us with great explanatory power, but also can trap us into real sort of cul-de-sacs and being able to understand what things are like. So if you look at the early, to me, if you look at Descartes in the early modern period, it's like the, in trying to understand the nature of reality, they end up falling into the analogy of clockwork because it's this incredibly powerful technology that's very easy for yeah. us to understand, right? And so then as we develop computation, right, and we develop machines, well, we start to analogize the body as the machine and the mind as the computer. And that's schema theory in motor learning, right? The, you, have a, you have these motor programs that you play out. Nikolai Bernstein blows that up in the 1920s. It just doesn't work. You can't account for motor control that way. And that's where dynamical systems enters uh, yep. no. motor control. And then you have, uh, um, and then you have, uh, the same thing with, with ecological psychology and understanding the mind and in the body again is it doesn't it, like there's this classic thing where you take a pig Stuart McGill takes a pig spine and he does as many he does a certain amount of flexion cycles on it and then it breaks and it says okay well you only have so many flexion cycles in your in your life right so so then there's this entire generation and and again, this isn't really Stuart's fault, right? Stuart's, 
a much more sophisticated thinker than the people who interpret him, maybe in the same way that Derrida yeah. and maybe Foucault is than the people who interpret him. But there was a, a huge swath of physical therapists who took this to mean that essentially the spine should never move out of neutral position, that athletic training, right? Kelly Stratt, who I am a huge fan of, who I love, and I think his, his ideas have become much more sophisticated. In his books, The Supple Leopard, has the first, one of his first rules for being a supple leopard is what he calls the one joint rule. Treat the spine as one joint, which is insane. Because yeah. why does it have all those other joints? <laughs> Right. Like, why would nature do that? Right. So you but but this is you're you're expecting that the spine operates as a machine. It's it's just it's just matter. Right. But you're not understanding that it's, that it 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 evolves. It changes. It it's dynamic. Right. Right. And so you you have the capacity to flex and flex over and over again forever, as long as you don't exceed the capacity of your body to recover from the flexion cycles. Right. Because the tissue gets stronger. Um, and so, but what was really interesting about this is so many of these people who came out of this physical therapy tradition of the neutral spine developed incredibly fragile spines. Yeah. And I've worked with all these physical therapists who, who hurt themselves as soon as their spine moves out of neutral and you have to move out of neutral. You absolutely cannot function as a human being without regularly moving your spine out of neutral. But if you try all the time, what you do is you you make the buffers of what your body can do small. Okay, so maybe I'm going too far with this, this analogy, but the point that I was making in that is that the analogy of the, of, of, of the body as a machine has not served us and trying to take it apart and make the pieces of it better, that's bodybuilding, all right, or aerobic training. And it doesn't function, right? You can look at the systems, the mobility system, the hypertrophy system, the cardiovascular system. You can break down, you know, back and by, chest and try. It's like this is failing us as a model for actually motivating people to move. And it's failing us as actually developing athletes who are anti-fragile and get development uh, str uh, strong well, right? Okay, go ahead. I want to show you what something here. Is, I want to show you what, so you said we had this model you know, the, the body's a machine, the mind's a computer, and it's failing. Yeah. And then you try to make, you're trying to make, you're trying to make it intelligible. Why is it failing? And then you engage in, in, in Derrida's deconstruction and Foucault's archaeology. What you said is there was a metaphor, which are normally made peripheral, right? Or Derrida's term, they're marginalized. And what we do is we, we pay attention to the argument and we forget the metaphor that's at the margin, but it's the metaphor that's really doing a lot of the work. And what you do is we'll foreground the metaphor and do what you did. Let's question it. Let's not assume that it should be an unquestioned thing. And then you bring in Foucault and say, you know what? We have to remember that these metaphors, can, right? They, they, they have a power to them. They're not just ideas that are true. They empower us in certain ways. And part of the reason why they're adopted isn't just their truth, but as you said, their power, the power they give us over nature, the power they give us over other people. So what you did is you said, wait, this is failing. The, 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 the model for modernity is failing. It's failing in people's lives. Why is it failing? Ah, it's failing because it had um, uh, an implicit metaphor that we should now foreground and question. That's Derrida. And we should then note, you know, well, in addition to it being, you know, untrue, why was it why was it so pervasive well it, it was bound up with the way it empowered us the clockwork model empowered us to work and, and we have to we have to step back and be willing to give up that power commitment when we give up the metaphor if we say i'm going to give up the metaphor but i'm going to keep the power commitment and this is Foucault's point that's duplicitous that's disingenuous if you want to give up the metaphor you don't just give it up in thought you have to give it up in right your commitment to it's the way it empowers you in the world. That's the Foucaultian uh, critique. And, and you were just doing it there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, whoa, jujitsu move you. I'm trying to show you, right, uh, how, you know, the, the moves that we're making have, they've become almost natural to us. Um, and that's perhaps a little bit worrying in itself. But those have been afforded by, you know, the basically, <laughs> You know, Nietzsche and Heidegger onward have given us the tools to make these kinds of critiques so that we can liberate ourselves. Boy, I'm not, I, don't, I don't usually use this language. We can liberate ourselves from the self-destructive, self-destructive 
aspects of modernism, particularly that model, notice there's, there was other things in there that were still implicit. It's the model of an individual body that's a machine, an individual mind that it's a computer, right? And it's non-developmental because the hardware doesn't matter, only the software matters. And the hardware is replaceable with technology here, right? That whole, like there's, there's, there's even more things to unpack in modernity's model of the human being and its relationship to the world. And notice that you think of the mind as a computer. What do you think of reason? Reason is completely instrumental. Its whole job is just to run whatever software it can to get the kind of output that it best needs to manipulate the world. And, and what do we do? We surround ourselves with reinforcements of both that power over the world and that modeling of ourselves in all of these computers that are doing all of these things right now. That's the kind of thing that, that is being talked about. It doesn't mean, notice I can, I can point out that and value that without saying, oh, well, that means that every power system is corrupt, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at, like, are we really, the way I try to see it is, uh, I, I, could, I try to, <laughs> I hope this won't be, sound ridiculously Canadian, but I, I think the, the most important attitude towards postmodernism, especially people like Derrida and Foucault, is a very studied and deep ambivalence. Precisely because, for me, what they what they are still, this is like Heidegger's critique of Nietzsche. Nietzsche, he said, Nietzsche was trying to escape from Christianity, and all he did was invert it. Mm -hmm. Postmodernism is showing us all the problems within. It's giving us the tools to critique modernism, but it's still trapped within the same framework of modernism. It's still, for example, trapped in the frameworks of nominalism. It's still, it's still trapped within a Kantian epistemology. It's still trapped within a certain model of science that really doesn't line up with, with how science actually operates. It's still bound to propositional tyranny. Mm -hmm. Not Derrida, there's nothing outside the text. Writing precedes language, all of that stuff, right? And so for me, I see it, <laughs> I see, I see it as, right, I see it as convergent with other critiques, mm -hmm. but what what, what it, it's it's still bound to the thing that that's why, and other people, Christopher Norris and other some some of the best commentators on postmodernism, especially Deacon Sutton, says, you know, it can't, it, it isn't a philosophy in its of itself. It's it's completely parasitic. It's completely dependent on on the productions of the modernist framework in order to have something to talk about. Now, I think that that's the unfortunate feature that tends to bleed into activism. And it's increasingly self-radicalization because it, it, it is ultimately a parasitic movement. It is a, it is a parasitic movement that only works by continually right, trying to criticize deeper and deeper uh, modernity without offering alternatives. But that's why I like the 4E cognitive science people and things like that, because they were, can make convergent critiques, but they're also proposing something other than the Cartesian Kantian framework. Sorry, that was a bit of a speech, but I wanted no, to. Okay. So there's a couple things that I wanted to do there. One is I want to note that, um, and, and maybe you can break this down for me, but we can come back to it. But, but essentially, you, you mapped the argument I made to arguments that Foucault and Derrida make. And sure. I, I accept that those arguments reflect each other. Now, whether, whether my capacity to make that argument is dependent on their having uh, uh, have made created those those argumentations or Heidegger or Nietzsche that's um that's something that I don't feel has been demonstrated right so so well then the thing to, to say is where have you gotten your critique of that from and you've got it from me you said and I have been influenced by those ideas okay. so that's yeah. a pretty direct line yeah, yeah. so um so anyways I, I think that I still think that I have some agnosticism about that but but I don't want to get too wrapped up in that one thing I, I but I, what I think is interesting here is the idea of one thing I find really interesting here is the idea of of of, uh, of postmodernism as being uh, parasitic and also unstable because yeah. it doesn't actually uh, propose a replacement, right? It critiques without transcending, in some sense. Yeah. And so this is so Peugeot has done some really interesting videos about the idea that that postmodernism views itself directly as parasitic, like it, it uses that description of itself. Right. And, you know, this is I a lot of people in my circles have pointed me to Ken Wilber. And, you know, we've talked about Integral a little bit. I started digging into it and I'm a little bit more skeptical of some of his models than than I was before I dug into it. But he has this this and I, 
this description and you know yeah. i think it's i think there's some truth in it some merit in it at least which is that you can't have a grand narrative that there is no grand narrative it just collapses and inverts right and so that's, that's, what mean, that's what i mean about it's very yeah. much like Nietzsche and, and this, Christianity. yeah and again pajot does i think brilliant work in showing how so much of what's happening is just inversion right yes you no know, he's just, we're just we're just we um we reject the hierarchy of male over female right but then we just recapitulate the pattern but put women at the top of it right so yes. he talks about this in um he had a really beautiful video where he, he broke down uh like that image happening over and over again you see logan replaced by the young woman you see um in mad max fury road max uh, furiosa replaces the 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 sort of male hero yeah. um, yes you, you see it over and over again but they don't they don't actually the, the female heroes don't actually represent a new form of virtue or a a an integration of the masculine and the feminine in a more sophisticated mature way no they just represent a kind of resentment of the negative aspect of the masculine and yeah. that there's this there's this sort of idea the idea seems to be the masculine messed up and is bad so it needs to be replaced with the feminine but there's no actually articulation of what that is or how that works or how it integrates better and they work better together he, he points this out as well as in moana right which I, I love moana and i think that it has some really beautiful beautiful elements in it but i also think his critique of it is quite interesting right that that the masculine culture figure is maui and essentially he's completely incompetent and everything is given to him at the end um yeah and, and there, there's other inversions that you know if you can see it people have noted this in the sitcoms uh from the 70s onward the adults the adults go from being sort of uh, All you know, they like figures into being, being becoming buffoons and then buffoons that and then their primary function is just to love and adore their children uh they don't have any sort of significant role uh, around that uh independent of that yeah. yeah i think there's a lot of that going on um and and that's really that's really uh, yeah I, so just i, I just want I, I just want to say that I mean, the, the fact that it's parasitic and the inversion uh, is actually problematic from even, I don't want to be in always in the position of, by the way, of defending postmodernism. Uh, but I mean, the, the you know, the, the best postmodernists are, are trying to uh, overcome the dichotomies. At least that you can, and you can see this, you can see this in the end, towards the end of Foucault's career, the technology of the self. And then Derrida starts to get into a discussion with uh, negative theology. Uh, because they're trying to, well, what would it be like to, instead of just critique, what would it be like to transcend? And of course, they have problems with that because they don't, they, 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 they don't have an ontology that affords transcendence, so they just invoke it, um, which is really problematic for Derrida, by the way, because he's deeply, deeply indebted to Levinas, and the concept of, of transcendence is crucial for Levinas's work, okay. yeah. Or who about who Levinas is? So Levinas is um, a, a, a philosopher. Um, he, he's Jewish. I, I, I only mention that because it actually matters uh, to his thinking. Um, and Levinas is famous for pointing out how ethics precedes ontology. This is his way of trying to break out of uh, the, 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 the modernity's claim that epistemology, so the ancient world is ontology precedes epistemology. And now mm -hmm. with modernity, it's no, no, with Descartes, think of it, you know. Epistemology, you do epistemology, and once you fit, you can't, until you finish epistemology, don't do any ontology. And then after that, perhaps some ethics, right? or you throw the ethics out off the side somehow, like Kant, right? Levinas was saying, no, no, no. What happens is we actually confront other people, he calls it the face or the other, and they directly challenge our egocentrism and our subjectivity. They put a demand on us to transcend ourselves. And that is, that 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 initial confrontation with the other, it right is the source of ethics because ethics requires at its fundament a transcendence of self-interest and self-centeredness. And so he says, right, uh, if what happens first is our ethics, 
and, and then the, the point along the way is, if you don't have any sort of ethical normativity, you're actually not going to get any epistemology. You're not going to get any ontology. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why if you if you if you read Derrida and you, you yeah. see it, you okay. see this in the movement, right? You see that underneath all of this stuff, there's this there's this ethical imperative that is very very um, powerful, but also very very implicit. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. The thing that's coming up for me is so I've been I've been reading I was reading uh, postmodernist stuff and then I was reading ecological psychology. Um, yes. And I, I love ecological psychology, but there's also a part of it that, that starts to feel self-referential and almost like another closed, almost theological system to me. Yeah. And one of the things about it is it's always about this this what is the the mind inside of and this this idea of this yes. reciprocal coupling relationship and they wave at the fact that motivational states are necessary, but it doesn't seem to be to be really hammered in on. Yeah. Whereas, like for me, and I, you know, if, if you're an ec ecological psychologist and you're listening to this, and I completely get this wrong, forgive me. I don't know the literature that well, but this is my sense. It, and, and tell me if I'm wrong here. I would nest ecological psychology within evolutionary theory. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that's fully happening. And the evolutionary theory tells us that the organism arises with motivations, right? It's trying yeah. to, it, it, at least we have appetite and aversion. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And those are necessary for any type of coupling to the environment. You have to have, you have to have a normative, what well, you just said, a normative framework. But the most fundamental normative framework is consume things that, that nourish you, avoid things that destroy you. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's, that's how life starts. Yes. Right. So then you, you start with these and we iterate out other motivational states on top of that. But the, it, the, the organism can't be coupled to the environment without a motivational state. I agree. There's no a motivational state. And so, so what, you're just, what I heard and what you're just saying is that before we have epistemology, before we have ontology, we have motivation. And understanding motivation is, is kind of that's we we have to we have to get that first in a way. Well, here's what I bring in, and I, I think that's right. I think it's out of Yeah. There, right. And then I I, I want to if we can bridge into how the relevance realization is that, yeah. and then how Derrida's difference yeah. I think is very similar to Verveke's relevance realization. Okay. Um, so, but, <laughs> but but one of the things that uh, one of the things that it goes goes with this is that. Autopoiesis and affordance are in, like are interdefining things. There's no affordances without autopoietic entities, yeah. but there's also no autopoietic en entities without affordances. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So, so again, I, it, it, if we say motivation, we have to understand it as that as that dyad, not just as an internal an internal feeling state that moves the the mind computer and the body machine. It's like no, no, no. The world has a certain intelligibility. There's this stuff happening in. And then motivation is the emergence of an affordance between them, um, so that action is now possible. They right? arise together, right? Yes. I, and I'm wanting to. Uh, I, there's a passage from the Tao Te Ching that wants to come forward in my brain, but I can't quite articulate it. But it's like being and non-being arise together. These things arise together. You have to have. Um, you you ha you can't have affordances. You can't have a, an autopoetic thing without an affordance. But the affordance doesn't exist it's not it's not real until there's an autopoetic thing to interact that's right that's right exactly so there there is a mutual mutual causality or or, or reciprocal causality there so and, and that's also something that right you don't you don't hear postmodernism reflecting on the fact that it's still committed to a newtonian physics the newtonian model of causality a, Uto a newtonian model of how human beings interact with the world right and, and so there's a way in which uh, it's, I think you're right. Um, the, the, the fact that it's sort of bound to the critique of modernism has rendered it incapable. And I have to be careful about this because at, like I said, at the end, Foucault's reading Hado and starting to really deeply reflect on Hado. And you know how deeply Hado has influenced me. And like I said, and Derrida is entering into conversations with Buddhists and, and, uh, and Neoplatonists. Foucault is reading the Stoics and he's also reading the Christian monks because he's trying to understand wisdom again. 
Like there's, there, right? And so I see the great thinkers towards the end turning away from critique and trying to open up to, well, trying to come up with a positive response. So, sorry, there's something that just keeps coming up for me that I, that I need to address, which is like, so as I was preparing for this interview and reading up, like I started to feel a lot more open to Derrida, right? Yeah. I, I listened to a very short essay on Derrida from like philosophy, yeah. from like philosophy.net on YouTube, right? And essentially they say that, that basically what Derrida does is he just, their description of Derrida is that Derrida elevates doubt and makes us start to question things. And I actually think this is really necessary. And like, you know, you and I have talked about R. Scott Baker and how much his work sort of keeps resonating for me. I keep, yeah, 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 the yeah. deeper my philosophy gets, the more I'm like, oh, oh yeah, Baker, Baker's imagery and symbolism and the way he wraps it in just keeps hitting for me. But the, the main character of, uh, of the, the arc of the second apocalypse is this character, Drusus Akami. And essentially he's a voice for doubt. That's really yeah. what he is. And, and that's really powerful to me, right? Like, like I, I, I described to, recently I've, I've been playing with this idea that like my fundamental axioms are respect mystery, mm. serve love, seek truth and cultivate virtue. Right. So it's like the outermost thing is that I that I will never know <laughs> that will always be insufficient in the face of of, their, of, the, of the mystery. Right. And the next thing is that the way that I orient towards that is love. And in order to serve love well, I have to put myself in a relationship to truth in order to be willing to face truth. I need courage and capacity and I need all those heroic virtues that I talk about. Yeah. And I think the kind of doubt you're talking about is not Humean doubt. It's yeah. not the it's not the epistemological hand wringing that has beset us for so long. It's Socratic aporia. It's okay. the kind of thing that sets you into wonder, right? It's Derrida who brings back the word aporia, right? Yes, and that and then that's not a coincidence, right? It's the idea of well, what you're trying to do is realize, right? You're trying to realize. You're trying to realize that <clears throat> you have, we have fallen into taking for granted the medium of our intelligibility without real, without remembering the cost of those medium. You, you pointed to that earlier. We said we had this metaphor, we have this way, we have this model, and then it has this cost. And we, we keep marginalizing and not paying attention to the cost. And we go, no, 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 no. And it's like the aporia is to get, it's like, it's like what the cynics would do, like Diogenes, right? The, the point of the aporia is to get your step back and go realize, oh, wait, it, maybe it doesn't have to be this way. And what are the costs of committing to it this way? Um, so, okay. So I really like that. I'd like to go further with that. But, there, but this thing, I have to get it out, which is Foucault to me, though, is still deeply, deeply disturbing. And I, I find him, <laughs> like, I, I think that, I think there is something sinister, something evil within postmodernism, and I really attribute a lot of it to Foucault. Oh, okay. Because, because I believe that Foucault, like um, Nietzsche, writes that you know, uh, in every you know that every philosophy is really the confession of the philosopher, right? Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Which is, and, I, I find that I always find that humorous about Nietzsche because he's all he's he's yeah. ever confessing too. Yeah. But, yeah. Sure, but but as I understand it, Foucault reads an essay where basically um, Nietzsche says that we need to that we that the idea of looking at history objectively is kind of absurd, and that the whole point of history isn't to under isn't to, isn't to understand the past; it's to be able to act in the present. Mm -hmm. So he then turns around and basically writes this series of histories that are philosophical where he happily falsifies things in order to get across his point, right? His whole, his whole analogy of the ship of fools in, in Madison civilization is just completely false. He just makes it up. He takes an image from Hieronymus Bosch and, and writes it into history. Yeah. And, you know, his second great book is Eros and Civilization, I think. And, and essentially, you know, his big argument is, is that all of the rules around sexuality are are socially constructed, and he's a sadomasochistic homosexual pedophile, and his desire is to 
is to is to be able to do these things. The little boys. He goes on and writes a letter with Jean Paul Sartre, and and Derrida and uh, Simone de Beauvoir, asking to get completely rid of all age of consent laws in um, in this. And he writes about the capacity of children to to have sexual feelings and and all this stuff. And as somebody who's a victim of sexual abuse as a child, like like this just is evil to me. Like Foucault yeah. is a figure yeah. of evil. And I mean, Noam Chomsky said that when he spoke with with um, with Foucault that he felt like he was the most profoundly amoral person he'd ever encountered. So like, for me, there's something, there is something I still see in, in postmodernism, like we're, we're making the case for some of the value of it and I, and I buy it. But I also think there's something deeply, that it's deeply about resentment and about essentially being able to, to strip down the structure of society such that you could play out your own perversions. I, I'm not going to deny that, that that that's going on. I would use Foucault to make that critique <laughs> of, of Foucault, which is to realize that whenever people are make, like making knowledge claims, um, they're also trying to create a particular way to wield power, which is exactly your argument. Uh, there's a, there's a there's an important postmodern irony in what you just did, which is uh, Foucault falls prey to a, a Foucaultian type of analysis. Um, but you can do the, but it goes back. I mean, and you know, um, you know, Nietzsche's argument that Christianity is just resentment can be understood as just the resentment of Christianity. I mean, you can, right? You can just like, oh, you were the son of a Lutheran pastor. Gee, I wonder why you dislike Christianity so much, Nietzsche. Right? I mean, and so like, and so the the concern I and I you know, my concern is I want to both respond as your friend and in love to the fact that you were abused and just first acknowledge that um and so i think you should endeavor to push back as virtuously but also as strenuously as you can against anybody that you in good conscience think is trying to make that more possible i think you have every not right i think you have every obligation to do that and so i want to yes i think you should and so I'm not trying to defend Foucault from that. I, that's what I tried to do with that jujitsu move that I just did and say, but look, what like what is it we're doing? Um and 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 the the thing that I, I would ask after you acknowledging what I just said to you, like as as a person, I mean, Schneider is one of the things he says that he's worried about, he says that you know, postmodern is, is only the latest symptom of something that's going back, basically. To nominalism on, but you can see it accelerating is what he calls intellectual impatience, um, where we're increasingly not caring about what is said and increasingly caring about who says it, and we're increasingly not caring about what they say, but either how can it be applied or what negative, possible ne negative ethical repercussions could it have down the road. Now, and, and you know, and, and agree, again, the reason why these take root is because there's some deep truths in them, right? We should like we. The, I think the character of the person should matter, uh, but we can now turn it in that if that's taken too far, it becomes like cancel culture. And but by the way, the left and the right are equally guilty of this. So claiming this is a left issue, uh, come on, the right is doing it too, right? It's, it is doing it too. I don't know that they're equally guilty. I think that might be a false equivalence, but they're certainly very guilty. On <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, well, I don't know. Oh, okay, so I'll withdraw equally because I haven't done enough empirical work. Um, but th there's... Let's, I would say that look, if you go back to the 90s, cancel culture was much more a thing of the right. And yeah. I would say that the most recent sort of drive towards cancel culture has largely been driven on the left. And the left has a lot more power to cancel at this stage. But there's large elements of the right that are trying to reclaim that power and apply it. Right? They don't. They don't. They don't have Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Google to apply leverage on their cancellation. But there's every evidence that if they did, they would be acting just as negatively or more negatively than the oh, people. Oh, but when they held the cards, when they held the churches, and they were yeah. the most powerful way of disseminating yeah. something, they were happy to wield it then. Oh, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. right. 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 Oh. Okay. So we we agree with that. So the point, uh, what I'm trying to say is, like this intellectual impatience. Um, it is, is, is something that uh, Schneider is saying we need to step back from. We need to, we need to pay attention to, you know, not just the source and the consequences, we need to play, pay attention to the manner and the matter. Like what is being 
what, what so, is being proposed and, and also how is it being proposed? Yeah. Because, because if not, if not we, we, are, we, are, we are removing the capacity for reason to itself be compelling as reason. We're only so, saying something's compelling because of who said it and because we agree with where it's going to go. To whom, right? And yeah. I mean, like, I want to acknowledge that and, and and say, like, there, I felt compelled to say that, right, yeah. and to share that. Now, there's multiple ways that that could play out. One way is actually essentially the the woke culture move, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I have placed myself in a category of marginalized group, a victim of sexual abuse. I have targeted a thinker as a exemplar of the people who have oppressed me. Yep. And I'm yeah, saying, yeah. This is now a reason to reject their thinking. Which is, by the way, is largely a religious style of argumentation, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Back to that at some point. So now, I, I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm trying to do. Sure. Right? I, I'm trying to, I mean, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to state that. I don't think that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay. Well, now, that, maybe that there's an underlying emotional reaction that is actually driving me in that direction. Right? And, and I, I wanted to acknowledge that, by the way. I did want to acknowledge that. I didn't yeah. want to dismiss that. I'm not trying yeah. to be dismissive of that. No, no, no. That's fine. So, so I'm, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just sort of saying, you know, just like acknowledging my own potential bias there. I think that um, it, I felt like it's useful to to bookmark that as a potential source of bias for me, but also yeah. as like a, you know. Like this has real consequences. These arguments. It does. It does. It does. Like a person who, like, Foucault makes the argument for pederasty from the Greek tradition, and yes. that's the same argument the person who abused me made. Yes, I know. But right. see, I don't want people to stop reading Plato because of that either. Okay. No, I, and and I'm not saying that you should. And I, I think this is an extra. Like, I, I wanted to write an essay about this in reference to the to movement to, to movement culture. Actually, our flawed forefathers. Right. Yes. Like. If you get rid of every, we will every, also be flawed forefathers. That's what we have to remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you get rid of every every man who's abused his power to to take advantage sexually of of somebody in uh, in the history of physical culture, you would be left. You would you couldn't you couldn't make a coherent culture. You couldn't yeah. make a coherent story of what had happened. If you got rid of everyone who had had done a bad business deal or taken advantage of an underling. Like Matt, you you could do this in science. Right. Yep. Yep. Every scientist who took some credit for something their graduate student did, you can no longer cite or or use in your argumentation. Like how many scientific cases would collapse? Do we stop uh, believing in the uncertainty principle because Heisenberg worked for the Nazis? Yeah, exactly. Right. So so I don't I'm not trying to do that with with Foucault. OK, I'm what I'm trying to say is I think there that there is within postmodernism something that is something in its DNA that is actually about trying to achieve that end, right? That the, the, the destruction of all sort of um, sexual mores that's yeah. still propagating itself with the left is very, very friendly to people who want to utilize it to victimize people. And, and so that doesn't, doesn't mean that everything that Foucault said is is dangerous or bad, or that there wasn't real insight in his work. But I would say that someone approaching his work should approach it with that understanding and should not dismiss that. Well, I think you're now coming close to the position that I've been advocating for, which is a deeply reflective ambivalence. Yes. That, that is the position I keep advocating for here. I think deifying or demonizing, I, it's funny, there's an irony here. I say that, and I say the same thing, you know, about, you know, Jordan Peterson. I think deifying him and demonizing him is to is to make him fundamentally irrelevant and and and, and remove you and allow you to be intellectually lazy and intellectually impatient with him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where and I think the same thing with postmodernism. I think right, you should neither deify it or demonize it. Right? I think you should do what we're doing here. This is to me the appropriate response. We disagree, but we dis we disagree. Uh, you know, friendly in a way in which we can get into dialogos. We're both drawing each other out. We're both deducing from each other. We're both moving towards each other. We're both moving around, right? Uh, the phenomena that's under investigation, right? That's all I'm. That's really all I'm arguing for. Um, and I, I think that 
the the, the, re, the, the what one of the things I, I'm worried about is is, is I, I agree, I agree. Let me just say this quickly: the, the deification of this stuff has turned into a, a religion. I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I think uh, unless you're just deeply entrenched in it, right? I, I think America is now, in fact, in the middle of a religious civil war between the Trump cult and the woke religion, uh, yeah. which, uh, which I think, uh, <laughs> two <I>, religions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's something worse, but man, they're really low on the on the on the category list of badly formed religions. QAnon versus woke is is, is a <laughs> well, well, but 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 that's but but I would say the fact that both sides are in the basement of their ontologies and their capacity for uh, deep uh, uh, sapiential transformation points to uh, Schneider's overall point that we have we have devolved to an increasingly short-term intellectual impatience. Um, so but, so what, what I wanted to say is that the, the, the deification in wokeism, I think your critiques are well, are well said and they should be paid careful attention to. My concern is the, demon, the demonization, right, leads to an unconscious, and you can see this in people like Rationality Rules and Stan Harris, Sam Harris, you can get, you can get uh, Steven Pinker, you can get this, and you've made this point, this uncritical valorization of modernism and a Cartesian framework that I think is worthy of being pretty much devastatingly destroyed uh, because of the way it is, it is, I mean, it is deeply misleading us both scientifically and existentially. So I'm trying to get to a place where we can step between those. And that's where I sound ridiculously Canadian, and I'm sorry. But. <laughs> <laughs> I have come to, I have, I don't know if I've told you this, this is, this is a really random thing, but so I'm, I grew up 50 miles from the Canadian border. Mm. And so Canadians come down here, traditionally came down here a lot to shop and also to ski on the mountains. And there's this like friendly um, disdain for Canadians. Right? <laughs> right, right. Little brother can't, his money doesn't, looks funny and doesn't. You know, it's like you're supposed to disdain Canadians, yep. right? And the accents, the hey, yeah. people, people, people in British Columbia, they don't believe me. No, nobody in British Columbia will admit this, but they don't say a, right? They say hey, yeah. Like, <laughs> Welcome to Canada, hey, right? <laughs> so, anyways, so then, so then, uh, then, then I found Jordan Peterson. His accent absolutely drove me crazy originally. And he becomes this huge influence for me. Now you and I are friends. You become one of my biggest influential. Now my favorite show is Letter Kenny. Have you seen Letter Kenny? <laughs> no, I know about it. Yeah. I swear Wayne is like he's like Jordan Peterson's less intelligent hick cousin, right? Like <laughs> sort yourself out, okay? <laughs> um, you gotta you gotta watch the show. It'll crack you up. Um, you'd be like, okay, I get it. Um, and so, yeah, I have this, this real Canada file thing that's happening. Now everyone tells me I have to read Marshall McLuhan. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I can handle liking <laughs> Canada this much. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, that's, that's, that's beyond the point, but it's, it's just a funny thing. I, I think these small rivalries are important, right? We have to have something in group out group, but, uh, well, uh, hopefully we have what, you know, what, you know, was in the Greek city states. There was enough yeah. shared culture, but enough difference that uh, there was this tremendous creativity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you need a you need safe places to put your 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 tribalism. Right? That's why. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah, 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 yeah. I refuse to like soccer. Just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like it's the one way that I can be a, a a jingoistic American in a way that's totally not harmful to anybody. <laughs> right. So, okay. So. Here, here's a point that I've been wanting to get to, though, and I, to get us back on, on, the, on the track. So, so I laid out James Lindsay's argument, right? And, um, and we've talked about Peterson's argument. And, um, I, I, th I think it's, it's too top down. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think we have to have an analysis that asks, what are the bottom up characteristics that give rise to this? So, I, uh, I wanted to read you a couple passages um, just just to give you a sense of how, like, I'm sure that you're familiar with this, but like, so I, I suppose I would say that my criticism of you is that I think that your project of saying, let's recover the value of postmodernism is smart. Like, I think that's great. Like, let's integrate it. And let's also be really, 
really articulate in what the in where the problem is, right? Yeah. And okay, the problem isn't necessarily what Derrida, Derrida is saying, or understand Derrida well, right? Yeah. But I don't I don't hear you often acknowledge, though you have in this conversation, just how much pernicious stuff flies under the postmodernism banner. And so I think it's valuable yeah. to be more 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 um, what's the word explicit about about the problem of postmodernism as a sort of phenomenon within the academy while also being able to say what's its source and is it really about those original thinkers and is there something valuable we can recover from those original thinkers i agree with that i think that's fair so, I, I would i would point out that uh, this this attempt to um appreciate postmodernism while also criticizing and move beyond it is one of the, one of the defining features of metamodernism. Yes, yeah, yeah. Metamodernism, yeah. I mean, this is what the integral people are pointing at. And yeah. So here, here's, a, here's a few quotes, though, that I think people, like, I, I, if people aren't familiar with this or haven't gone through it, like, and one thing that bothers me is a lot of people seem to think that this stuff started in, like, 2014. Um, and it's like, no, <laughs> like it starts in the 70s, at least 60s, 70s. So the, oh, well, it starts before that. Romanticism, nominalism, we're going way back now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 1992 draft of the National Science Education Standards, for example, claimed to be based on a contemporary approach called postmodernism, questions the objectivity of observation and the truth of scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. A recent book in science, Paul Foreman, a historian of science at the Smithsonian, speaks approvingly of our postmodern world with a social constructionist epistemology and morality-based rather than truth-based Weltgefühl, which I think means basically worldview. Many scientific educators now endorse a postmodernist perspective on science, which incorporates some of the more extreme feminist views. For example, students supposedly need to learn that the so-called laws of nature are social constructions whose validity depends on consensus. The consensus is driven by interests, not epistemic considerations. Science is politics by other means. Yes. There's no legitimate universal science, only local ethnosciences which have been oppressed or colonized. The emphasis on so-called scientific objectivity only serves as a cover for exploitation. Instead, we need advocacy research and emancipatory science. Um, the very form, uh, it is quite a, uh, whatever uh, sophisticated caveats one may wish to put on the viability of the de facto value distinction, and whatever, however difficult it may be to ever live up to the scientific ideal of a disinterestedness, it is quite a radical step to call for the deliberate injection of politics into the very formation of uh, yeah. scientific hypotheses, as does Helen Longino, professor of philosophy and women's studies at Minnesota. I am suggesting that feminist scientific practice admits political considerations as relevant constraints on reason. If faced with a conflict between political commitments and a particular model of brain behavior, we allow the political commitments to guide the choice. Yeah. And I, I see this over and over again. I've, I've seen interviews with, with scientists, people who are coming up in the field, who do not see science as instrumental towards truth. They see it as serving a political function. Like James Lindsay has talked about medical lysenkoism. Like, and I think essentially we're, we're seeing lysenkoism arise in, in every different field as it's colonized by critical theory. Yeah, I, I agree that that's happening. Um, um, I, and I think that all of that was uh, pernicious. Um, however, again, uh, do the thing that they worried about, caveat. Uh, it, it isn't Foucault who first says knowledge is power, it's Francis Bacon. Okay. One of the founding figures of the scientific okay. worldview, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, there's a little bit of throwing stones in glass houses going on there. It's like, well, yes, sure. that is pernicious, but what is it that you know what it what what did bacon mean and how has that been knowledge is power can mean we should that. put nature on the rack and torture her to reveal her secrets how's that well, yeah yeah that's a pretty harsh one but there's still a difference between um saying that all knowledge is just a construction of power and saying that knowledge empowers us those are two quite different things to me but how does it empower us and in what way, right? It empowers us because what it does is the, the main point of science is not the epistemic accumulation of truth. The main point of science is to 
give us control over nature. Um, and, and he's using religious imagery there, putting nature on the rack. Almost always it's going to be a woman, by the way, not a man, right? Um, and, and, you know, and there's all, there's all kinds of stuff going on there. Now, again, does that mean that we should stop reading Einstein? No, I'm not saying that, right? But what I'm saying is, that's what they're saying. What they're saying is don't read Einstein because he's a dead white male, right? And, 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 that, and, and, that's, and that's exactly the mistake. The mistake, and so the, the, point, the, point, the point is, but let, 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 again, the, the point I wanna make is what made that, what made like your, your question, what was the bottom up? What was the fertile soil that made that seed take root? It isn't just, right? sort of postmodernist propaganda, and I think what you read there is propaganda, right? Yeah. It's the fact that we had we had Kuhn and Lakatos and Feuerabend, right? And all the anti-realism within science. And all of these people are actually doing, as far as I can tell, really sincere, deeply rationally reflection, deep rational reflection on the nature of science. And I think those, and, you know, and those debates haven't been resolved. The demarcation problem is still a real problem Right, and the realism anti realism debate is still a real issue in science. And so, again, like we, we can't then go back to saying, oh, well, science just is this mm -hmm. algorithmic access to truth, this ahistorical yeah. machine that just gives us the truth. That's also, I think, deeply wrong and deeply misleading. So, so is there a way in between those? Yeah. So, by the way, for anyone who wants to get the source of those quotes, is this book, Professing Feminism by uh, Daphne, Cor Daphne Pate and Noretta Corky. Um, and I want to read you one more passage out of it because I think it speaks to what you're saying. I think it's really powerful. Right. Because, so they're, they're, they're talking about the anti-scientism of, of feminism and they highlight this passage as exemplary of it. But I actually think that this passage is, 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 is appropriate and true. Okay. Right? Um, the sociologists of science, Harry Collins and Trevor Pinch, would not describe themselves as being anti-science. Their popular book, The Golem, is constructed around a very ambivalent metaphor. Science is a golem. It is powerful. It grows more powerful every day. It will follow orders, do your work, and protect you from the ever-threatening enemy, but it's clumsy and dangerous. Without control, a golem may destroy its master with its flailing vigor. Yeah. And this, I actually think, is right at the heart of what you're doing. It's the heart of Peugeot. It's the heart of, uh, of what Peterson's doing. All of it, and, and it essentially... And th this is also where I get tripped up with James Lindsay, because in in um, in Peugeot's conversation with rationality rules, he asks, "Where do you stand? Right? Where do you stand?" Yeah. And and he's saying that you're what I think he's saying. I should say is that you're trying to you're invo you're invoking a circular reasoning to to justify your normative stance from your scientific epistemology. And it, it's, it's, inc it's, it's incoherent, right? Um, and and what, what I think that indicates is that science can only operate effectively within a normative framework. Exactly. Right? So what the problem is that critical theory and postmodernism as a sort of not this thinking of Foucault, but as a as a as a yeah. broader phenomenon within the social sciences and critical literature, it it has assumed it has it has adopted a religious normative framework that uh, that believes that it is a science. It believes that it is a, a a a that because it comes out of academia that is validated in the same way that sciences are, and it wants I agree. to I agree. colonize science. And completely take it over. Like everything has to serve that. That's right. That's right? right. And that so, is ultimately a theological move, yeah. not an epistemological move, or yeah. even an ontological move. I get that. I get that. So the problem with, that I have with Lindsay is he correctly diagnoses the problem, but he actually doesn't have a solution because he's still trying to pretend that he's standing in a place from nowhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, he, and he's not, he's talking about the left. Which is which is great, but I think it's like, well, what is the liberal tradition? What is the conservative tradition? Like, and how do all those things apply? It's like you can, it, it's distorting to me as a lens when you sort of say, okay, we're going to just just look at this as as the problem. Right? I don't I don't think that you should be out. I, I think that, and I don't do this, but I think that if you're looking at wokeism, you should be looking at QAnon, 
right? And you should be looking back to how Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals was adopted by, uh, oh, what's his name? Not Ken Starr. Um, there was a, the leader of the Republican Party behind the scenes who got uh, Bush elected. I can't remember his name, but he basically oh, yeah. Yeah. used uh, uh, the Rules for Radicals to drive the political uh, narrative in America for te- uh, a decade mm-hmm. on the Republican side. So um, now I'm getting all passionate about all <laughs> too many different things. But to go back to it, um, what I one of the things that I wanted to do here is get back to this analysis of what is the bottom up, right? I think we've done a, a beautiful job of kind of articulating a lot of these things. And I wanted to offer an idea. And, and then sure. right, do you have a time constraint? You're looking a little distracted. No, I'm, I'm not distracted at all. I think, okay. I, think I, I think I was looking inward to okay, sure. okay. What, what, what's my state of mind. I think that's yeah. all. I, that's all, all I was doing. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, so uh, after the after George Floyd's um, murder or manslaughter, uh, there was these huge protests and it happened all over the world, right? Mm-hmm. And I felt like those protests were really out of scope and the way that the problem was being described was inaccurate right there are there are lots of racial problems in america but the rate at which there's you know 19 unarmed black men were killed by police that year and 40 white men were killed and you can look at george floyd and you can look at tony timpa and see the same thing but nobody knows who tony timpa is Mm -hmm. and yes black men are killed at a rate that is outside of their, their percentage of the population, but if you understand the levels of, uh, of encounters with the police and crime that are happening within those communities, it all, it all makes sense, right? It's, there, are more, there are more black men murdered in one weekend in Chicago by other black men than there were by police, right? So it, is police brutality a problem? Yes, it is. I mean, I think Roland Fisher is the best criminologist who's looked at this, and he's found that, that that uh, black men are about 50% more likely to get low level uh, force uh, from police officers in any given encounter, right? Right, right, so right. One thing encounter begins, and that's a real issue. And I have lots of black friends who, who report their really uncomfortable um, uh, experiences with the police. So I'm not dismissing it, but I'm saying when you look specifically at lethal violence, you don't find that there's a real, um, there's a real issue there and that, um, that it was being propagated through the, the media narrative was that this is a huge problem. There's an open season on young black men, right? This was happening all the time. And then you had these huge protests that were incredibly destructive to the very communities that were, they were supposed to serve, right? They're creating food deserts and, you know, companies are, are running away. And, you know, uh, Lyndon, uh, Leonidas Johnson has documented all of the black children who've been killed as a result of street violence, right? And we've seen that murder rates in these communities are up 400%, right, since the George Floyd protests. Right. So I wanted to speak out about this then, but I didn't feel like I could because, because I felt like it would fall on deaf ears. And I felt like it would fall on deaf ears because I didn't, I, I actually wasn't speaking from the right place, right? Yeah, yeah. Speaking from a place of, of being, feeling like, you know, they've got it wrong, right? And so I thought, so I was trying to understand like why, so if it's true, if my narrative is true that that's not really a problem, well, why are people so open to hearing that it is a problem? So it, ter- it turns out that my, uh, my, my grandfather was mixed race mm-hmm. and he, um, his family was from British Guiana and they came across Ellis Island and they were, they were labeled as mixed race and then they passed. Right. And he, he, he never would admit that he was Portuguese, certainly not that he was part African. And he actually threw people out of his house for, for saying that he was Portuguese. He threw my, my, so, so my, my, my great aunt, uh, Eleanor, she, I think it was Eleanor, she told my mom and her sisters 
that they were actually Portuguese in ancestry. And they went and told Jack, my, my grandfather, that they had heard that. And I'm like, why did you tell us we were English? And he, 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 wouldn't, he threw them out of the house. He wouldn't listen to them. Right? So it turns out that when we trace the history of that family back, um, I, think, I think it was Eleanor, my, aunt, my great aunt Eleanor, she had married a mulatto man. And he, so she had basically kind of lost contact with her family because of that. Then he had, um, that man had, uh, had, a, had a wealthy British father. And he was, he was raised in like an orphanage for, for mixed race men who had wealthy British fathers. And he, he was trying to make contact with his father. He wanted to be acknowledged by his father. And eventually he was completely rejected. And in response to that rejection, he took a gun and shot himself in the head in front of his entire family. And so his children were bathed in his blood. And there's like, you know, media accounts of all of this. So then his, his wife now, without support, has to move to New York on her own with her children. So then something happens with my great-grandfather. We don't even know. We have no idea what happens. But his family has to move to New York, too. Right. And now uh, my great-aunt, she, she, she's in poverty. And so she has to actually give her children up. And my, um, my, my great grandmother, she, she actually has enough money left over from, from whatever they inherited from their estates. They own sugar plantations in British Guiana that she, she has enough money to take care of the family, but she refuses to, to take care of her grandchildren because she doesn't want people to know that she has mixed race grandchildren and she doesn't want people to get wind that her children are, are mixed race. Like that's what we think happened. We don't know exactly, but this is the story, right? So then my, my, my father, my grandfather grows up basically hiding who he is. Right. My, 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 uh, my great grandmother tells everyone that she's, that she's from Scotland. Right. And even though she has a Caribbean accent. Right. And then she, but then, you know, then there's all this trauma in my family and all this neglect and abuse of the children, sexual abuse. And, and I don't know, maybe that's, that stuff happens in every family, but it's possible that that's part of their trauma of all these horrible things that happen to them specifically because of their racial inheritance. Right? So now play that forward. So my mom, you know, she makes choices. She ends up being blind to certain things. Certain things happen to me. Certain things happen to my sister. Right? Well, you could, you can't know for sure, but one potential causal factor is actually the history of racism. Yes. So yes. that that ghost affects me as a, you know, middle class white male in our society. So if those intergenerational traumas are playing out in my life, I can say, well, how are they playing out for people who it's much closer for, right? And even if police are not less likely to be lethally violent today, how long has that been true? Yes. And how easy is it to believe that it's not true? When it wasn't true for your uncle yes. or your father. And so I started thinking that this has to be acknowledged as part of the story, right? Even if racism is not the th this is not the problem that is described as by critical theory, the ghost of racism still has massive implications on people who are living to this very, you know, to this very day, to quote Deontay Wilder. And yeah, I, I I've I've been trying to advocate for this thing like not talking so much about uh, systemic racism as talking about historical racism. Yeah. Um, as, again, not to deny that there aren't things going on here now, because there are, but to try and say that people might be not just responding to synchronic factors, they might be very well also responding, and legitimately so, to diachronic factors. Yeah. Um, I, had this, I, had this, I had this idea that like I've watched people go through grief and it's not, you don't, it, it, it's not a linear process. No, the four, that, that stage model is very, it's, it, it, it's not supported by a lot of good empirical evidence, by the way. Like it, it'll, it'll be gone for a while and then it'll come up and it'll hit you and it moves in waves and all these things. And I started thinking that like, what we were seeing was a grief was a grieving for the history of what had happened to African-Americans in this country. 
I think so. And I think that's why a lot of the responses took on a religious tone because religion has been generally a way in which we've tried to deal with deep grief, uh, deep sense of suffering and grief. Yes. And so, so it's like, okay, well, so it's partially, let's say grief, grief on the part of African-Americans for what they've experienced and what people who are close to them have experienced and how that's played out through the generations. And maybe it's grief on the part of, of white Americans on the part that they played in that, right? As brothers in this nation. Um, so I started thinking, okay, well, okay, there's that. And then, and then I, like, I was also really thinking about um, Peter Turchin's model, right? Peter Turchin offers this model that, that conflict in culture rises when you have a set of, of, of economic conditions, when you have relative immiseration of the poor, overproduction of elites. So you have lots of people who have PhDs now who can't get jobs. Yes. Right. And also increasing diversity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Pajot said something really recently that was really striking to me. He said that diversity without unity is death. Right. Like when you when you break things apart into smaller, smaller groups and you make your group identity more and more salient without making the overarching identity salient, the only direction that takes you is in the destruction of the overarching identity. Like we can't we can't be African Americans and white Americans, gay Americans and all these things and make the the not the American part less and less important and have America work. That's right. Um, but on the other hand, you I mean for Pajot's point, which is a good point, there's Durkheim's point, which you know. You don't want mechanical solidarity. You want it to no. digital labor in society, right? So yeah, we, we need this balance, right? It's, well, it's it's your complexification model. Exactly. Exactly. You need diversification and unification. Yeah. We need yeah. to be able to have our individual identity and we need to have it subsumed in these hierarchical identities. And we need to work on how we better integrate all of those levels. Yes. So anyway, so I was thinking about that and I was like, and then there's a technological element to this. Right. I'm I've been a geeky person on the internet long enough that I remember when what became wokeness was largely contained on live journal. And there was these incredibly toxic dynamics between like young adult authors accusing each other of racism and sexism constantly on this one little corner of the internet. And then live journal was taken over by Tumblr. And then it was like man, don't go on Tumblr and be part of these communities because these people are killing each other. Like they're just absolutely talking to each other. And then that was on Twitter, right? And then it was all through college campuses. And then it implodes. And I think, you know, part of this analysis misses the point that I was making here, which is, you know, this stuff has been, the, the ideology has been propagating throughout the academia since the 1970s, at least. But, but the technology blew it up well right? and the adversarial ag algorithms right yes and the adversarial algorithms absolutely so so this this is my model for for what's happening right it's not that gramsci says do this and marcuse says do this and crenshaw says do this and then it it just emanates down it's like there are underlying factors like grief like historical racism, like elite overproduction and this. And then there's the technological factors in adversarial. And all of those, all of those come together to create the potential for this conflagration. And so when we when we criticize postmodernism, we have to elevate our analysis beyond pointing the finger at postmodern neo-Marxists. Right? And say, so what, what is this overarching phenomenon? And if we understand it that way, I think we have a much better set of tools to actually address it. Right? So, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with that. I mean, I, I've been, I didn't get a chance to make that move in the argument, but I was preparing for the argument of trying to resituate my critique in the Kantian sense of postmodernism back within the larger framework of the meaning crisis, because that's what I was, uh, and that what I see postmodernism trying to do is. I, I think it is both a symptom and a symptomatic response to the meaning crisis. Um, and trying to understand it through that lens has been uh, what, I've, what I've been trying, sort of trying to argue towards 
uh, here here today with you. Um, and so I, I agree with what you just said. Uh, and, um, and, and I'm not saying the meaning crisis is the only bottom-up factor. I'm not saying that. I've, I've repeatedly said that, by the way, right? All right. There, there's all these other factors. Economic crises, you know. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah all of that. All of that. The meta crisis, uh, as Thomas Bjorgman said. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, so I don't, I, I would, I don't have anything to say in, in, in response to that move you just made, other than, and, and I'm sorry, I, I hope this doesn't sound sort of post facto. I was trying to argue towards that sort of thing. Where, like, I can we that's, it, yeah. I think that's a signal of of a it's a it's a sort of independent verification, yeah. Right, it's a signal that that um, that the thought process I'm working towards is is validated by uh, by somebody I, I deeply respect. I mean, I wanted to lay the argument out for you for how yeah. I was seeing the bottom up aspect of it and get your um, your take on it. Is there is there is there a factor I've missed? Is there something that and then so there's two questions, right? Is my, anal is my analysis of the factors solid? And is there a way that, that we can strengthen it? And then if we understand that, what does that actually tell us, right? Like I've been looking at James Lindsay and Sam Harris and other people who've been sort of trying to argue against the woke. And I've said like, your logic is, is, is really strong and it doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. And so I, I don't, I think that there's another move that needs to be made. And I think that that move that move has something to do with one empathizing, which is like, okay, your your description of reality uh, as systematically racist isn't accurate, but the emotional antecedents that that predispose you to it exist for a reason, and that needs to be validated and understood. Um, and then my. my my pitch would be that fundamentally the, the, the central problem that we have is that we have no system that orients us towards virtue and the develop and, and tools to develop virtue. And that in order to fix that, in order to fix the problem, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Well, I, I, that's where I'm in complete agreement with you because I mean, I was trying to say, maybe, or maybe one way of interpreting it that's convergent with what you did is saying, me trying to say for all of, the, the, the legitimate criticisms that can be made of postmodernism. I didn't get a chance to make those, but anyways, um, <laughs> um, it's put its finger on the fact that we are in the midst of the hyper object of the, you know, the demise of modernism as that overarching unit, unifying framework. That's what gave us our common unity, our community. That's what community means, right? Um, and, and so, and that's the meaning crisis, that's anomie, that's all, you know, again, I'm not going to repeat arguments you've heard me make yeah, multiple yeah. times. And so that's what I meant when I tried to say it's both a symptom of and a, an attempt to respond to, because what it's, do, it, it's, it's, it's a symptom of the, that collapse, but its response is to try to accelerate the collapse. And there's a sense in which I can get that. But your point is nevertheless well taken. Yeah, but accelerating the collapse, yes, that's that's like you know, that's like cauterizing the wound, right? I, I like it, it's like it, it's prob probably it, yeah, you'll end the you'll end the problem, but you won't have you you'll have left a, a deeper problem, which is the vacuum. Uh, um, and so there's two things that I've been trying to argue against, which is the attempt to shore up modernism and to try and no, let's get back to the enlightenment, enlightenment now. No, that that's not going to work. Uh, but I've also like I also want to like valorate valorize what you're saying, which is okay. But can we recover a worldview, a a sense of wisdom and reason and virtue and meaning and meaning in life that is viable and it is an alternative to that? And that's very much my project, and that's that's the project you're engaged in, and so. I try to engage with postmodernism insofar as it gives me tools for critiquing modernism and enlightenment uh, models of cognition and humanity and virtue. And also, but I also step back from it uh, and follow another line that I indicated at the very beginning of our talk that went into 
right? This new appropriation of reappropriation of Plato. And sorry, sorry you were gone for there for a sec. No, my camera just died. Oh. <laughs> it can't last more than two hours. <laughs> so, and I said, you know, and also the whole way this, this neo Heideggerian phenomenology, post phenomenology uh, has, has come in. There's also a whole other thing that I'm actually deeply engaged in right now with Dan Chappie, which is the whole move, which is called speculative realism, which is the whole attempt to get outside of modernity's way of doing epistemology and metaphysics, object-oriented ontology, uh, the, new, the new ways in which Whitehead has now come back into prominence and is intersecting very deeply with physics and biology or e-cognitive science. This is all, this is to my mind where right, we can move post postmodern, if you'll allow me to say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so. Uh, <laughs> I've been described. Um, someone recently described me on Twitter as an, at a, who's like, he's a movement teacher, he's a meta rationalist and regularly conversing with John Vivek. I was like, okay, I, 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 I have not self described as a meta rationalist or deeply engaged in in the conversations that call themselves meta rationalism but it, it does make sense to me as a as a framework yeah and for me for me that's you know this, that's the attempt to get back to what i'm arguing for which is the ultimately dialogical uh nature of reason and that reason that the, the the deepest form of reason is not consumptive reason it's not even it's not even communicative reason the deepest function of reason is Contemplative. That what re, that reason does is, is it is reason is ultimately about the the goodness of intelligibility, and the intrinsic goodness, and it's 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 something you do for its own sake, like the way you listen to music for its own sake, because music reveals you to you the inherent goodness of your sensibility. Reason reveals to you the inherent goodness of intelligible the intelligibility of the world, and that has an inherent value for human beings, and and that's. That's that's the ultimately what's supposed to be the compelling power uh, of, uh, of of uh, of reason. That that's Heidegger's notion of the aletheic notion of truth, not correctness of propositions, but this 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 connectedness, disclosure of what's real. Aletheia is another Greek word that, that you use. Can you remind me what that means? Oh, aletheia. So aletheia is the river of forgetfulness, uh, uh, and aletheia is unforgetfulness. It's like like the time remembering it is to so it's, it's like the idea reason. it's the idea of it's the kind of truth that is found within participatory knowing the truth that emerges in that, that is emerges with the intelligibility of the world and the relevance realization that that plugs into that um would you say that aletheia maps somewhat well to the buddhist concept of awakening I think when Aletheia is properly functioning to orient perspectival and procedural and ultimately propositional knowing, such as to system systemically and systematically reduce self-deception and afford enhanced um, integration of the world. The, when Aletheia, if I'll put it in the slogan with A's, when Aletheia affords anagoge, that's awakening. When Aletheia affords Anagage, that's a week. Sounds like a really strange pop song. <laughs> it's like uh, if uh, if the Beatles were uh, were philosophers, are more philo yeah. philosophical than they were. Yeah. Um, I think we may have come to a, a good resting point for the discussion. Yeah. Today. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's more to unpack. You know. There's, uh, you're, you're throwing things at me that are uh, past my uh, my current level of education, but uh, but oh, I didn't mean to do that. I, I wanted to play fair. No, no absolutely. No, of course, please don't apologize. Um, it's just you know, uh, I, I I feel really happy with the level of of insight I, I hope that I offered back, and and I feel like this was one of the most powerful dialogues. Um, I think that there is something really valuable for me in in encountering. The depth of philosophy that you have, and, and I, I hope that as a as an eager student with a perspective that that um, that's rooted in in these other practices that I offer expertise in, uh, I give something very valuable in return. 
You did totally, and, and I appreciate it. I want to thank you for it. I mean, I, I want I, I, like having much more careful and wonderful conversations about you know postmodernism. I think is needed to get us to a place, like I said, where we can avoid the Scylla and Charybdis of uh, deification and de demonization. Um, I, I, I really... Scylla and Charybdis are uh, the guardians of the underworld, right? Well, they're, they're, they're Jason and the Argonauts, I believe, or is it Odysseus? I always get those confused. I think but, it's Jason and the Argonauts. But... Yeah, I'm pretty sure and he's sailing and, he, and there's two monsters, one on either side of the ship. And the trick is to sail between the two monsters of Scylla and Charybdis, uh, so that you go, you don't get drawn down and and drowned or destroyed. All right, um, relativism and um, perennialism. And, yeah, relativism. I was going to say, you know, naive positivism, right? Like or like something like that. Yeah, yeah. The world is is knowable, absolutely. Rather yeah, than as an unfolding mystery. And, and I like Highland's notion that we have to get back to the Platonic Socratic notion of finite transcendence. We are finite beings and we will always be finite beings, but we are finite beings who will always be capable of transcendence. A transcendence that doesn't make us non-finite, but right, and nevertheless a, a real transcendence. And Plato is trying to remind us of that and that that is, what, that is our dignity, our nobility. It is, it is how we are, we properly accept our station um, in, in, in the cosmos. So we never did get back to how postmodernism is impacting your understanding of, Play, uh, of Plato and how that's valuable. <laughs> um, but I think that's good because I think that it gives us uh, another starting point for well, uh, it, a new uh, dialogue. Yeah, um, in, that, in that second dialogue, if we could also talk about connections between difference and relevance realization. I would, yeah. really, I would really like that too. That would be very, very good. And, um, one of my desires is to is to understand Plato more deeply. So if you could send over some resources for me to to start digging into, um, because I know obviously he's, he's incredibly fundamental to your worldview, but I haven't read him, um, and obviously it's it's fundamental to all of philosophy. So uh, it's kind of uh, it's time for me to to dig into that. I think so. I'd be happy to send you a a, a, a list of sort of the best books. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, John. It's always an incredibly insightful experience to be in dialogue with you. And uh, it's felt very meaningful to me to, to have this conversation today. Well, me too, Rick. And thank you. Thank you. I mean, and I appreciate your generosity and your flexibility around this. Um, and so thank you for that. Awesome. Hey, you've reached the end of another Evolve Move Play podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, if you want to be involved in the conversation, please consider joining us in our new membership subscription so you can get access to question and answers with our live speakers once a month, question and answers with me once a month, and a dedicated forum to discuss everything going on in the podcast, as well as a general discussion of movement on our general movement forums. If you're interested in that, make sure to check out the link below, get signed up, and join a part of our membership community. If you can't join our membership community right now, it's still always helpful if you can like, share, and subscribe, and even hit that bell and get notifications for upcoming Evolve Move Play podcasts. But adios for now, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.